On this episode, we talk overtime rules and how a judge put a stop to it. LeGrand's employees are saving them tons of money. And there's some cool stuff called bioadaptive lighting that you totally need in your house. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. Welcome to Resi Week. This is your weekly wrap up of all the latest news and stories for the residential AV industry. I'm your host, Matt D. Scott. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by a couple of really great people. First, we have Alex Capasolantro. He is the co founder and CEO of Josh AI. Alex, how are you today? Doing great, and you got my name perfect too. Thank you. Yes. That was the whole goal of today's show, was not to screw that up. Uh, next, we have Richard Fragosa. He is A, a really good friend of mine, but two, he's the principal and founder of Fragosa Designs. How are you, sir? Good. Mellow West Coast post Thanksgiving greetings. So You're much more mellow than I am today. I seem to be very high on energy. It's a West Coast thing, man. I know. I know. I, yeah, can't do it. Uh, last but certainly not least, we have Tim Albright. He's the founder of Aviation.tv, the little Hello. place that gave me a show. Hi, Tim. Hey. Hello, sir. How are you? I am well, and you got my last name right, too. I know. I, I'm on a roll today. Uh, let's kick this off. It's kind of a big deal as I'm loading it up here. Uh, this just was announced uh, literally minutes ago by our friend Jason Knott uh, over at CE Pro. A federal judge is blocking the 47,000 overtime exemption law. Uh, this was set to take effect December 1st to raise the threshold, if you don't know about this. Uh, so everybody who is making uh, less than 47,000, you'd have to pay overtime to. Uh, this is, uh, as I said, blocking it and dropping, you know, keeping it at the, the existing level of 23 and a half. So, uh, Josh, it, or sorry, Alex, is this a is this a really big deal for integrators? Um, I think so. I mean, fortunately, I'm on the manufacturing side, so for my employees, um, we're we're not necessarily going to be hit too directly by this. Uh, we end up paying engineering salaries quite often, so prices are way above that threshold most of the time. <laughs> um, but for for a lot of the integrators we work with, it's certainly something that's being discussed, and you know, it's um. It's, it's, I I think this announcement's good, but what the announcement is talking about, right, is rectifying what I think would be bad for the industry. Very good. Richard, you've been, you've been in the biz a long, long time. Um, Sure, you've had your experiences with, you know, techs and and entry-level guys that are making this sub, you know, 47,000 range. Is this, is this better for the, uh, for the owner? Uh, or ownership, or is this going to be better in the long run for for the the employees? Well, it, it, I think that the the hardest part, if you talk to any small integrator, that they have is keeping people. Um, they spend a whole lot of time training them. They spend a whole lot of time getting them up and running, and then invariably, I mean, I remember I, I when I broke in, I, I they got me dirt cheap, <laughs> and, and I knew it. Um, but there was a certain point where my skill set allowed me to reach a different income threshold. Um, but that wasn't necessarily something that somebody else might have available to them. And so I, you know, here's the West Coast Vibe thing again, you know I mean? But in, 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 in terms of the equity, in terms of maintaining a workforce, and especially here in California, I mean, our cost of living is so ridiculous that, um, you know, th- this doesn't necessarily apply just because of where we are in the Bay Area. In other parts of the country, I could see it being uh, people are being affected. I mean, our, our labor rate and our, our uh, technician rates and our salaries are obviously commensurate with the cost of living here, which is obviously quite different than maybe somewhere in the South or, or in the Midwest. Um, you know, in the major metropolitan areas, which is where a, a large part of our industry is focused, um, I don't know if it's going to be as um, 
uh, as, as much of a huge impact. But I think in the smaller markets, yeah, this is something definitely to look out for. And it's going to cause a lot of the employers to, well, and more importantly, and, and I think better run their businesses better. I mean, this has been the natural evolution about running your business better and maturing as a business. And part of that is maintaining, um, you know, a qualified and, and well compensated workforce. Tim, as somebody who is based in the Midwest, mm -hmm. where, you know, as Rich just said, it, this may be more applicable, it, you know, obviously when they brought this out, there was a lot of noise in the, in the industry about how this was going to affect uh, the bottom line and affect dealers. Is this something where the, the salary cap numbers that, they're, that they were using were out of line? Or is it something where they should have split the difference? Uh, oh, wow, split the difference. So the 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 mark that they were setting at that the, the federal rule set at, at was forty seven thousand. That you know just below fifty thousand. Um, I still remember my first job um, twenty twenty five years ago. I barely made this the minimum, minimum it's at now at twenty three thousand. Right. Um, you know, we are very inexpensive in the Midwest. I have come to find out over the last five or 10 years um, <laughs> in talking with buddies like Rich Fergoes and talking to our, our friend uh, George Tucker and, and uh, Chris Netto out in New Jersey and New York. Yes, we are incredibly inexpensive. However, finding a, a decent tech that is, is going to put you right in that middle if you want to split the difference. So quick math, 23 to, to, to 47 is is roughly $24,000 uh, difference. So you got $12,000 there. So it's going to put you just shy, just south 35. of 40 grand. That's going to be in the average, you know, entry level tech um, and, and, you know, some beginning design engineer jobs here mm -hmm. um, and even some pro beginning programming jobs. So you're still going to have a good swath of your workforce that's going to be affected if you if you they do split the difference, as you said, and around the thirty five, thirty six thousand dollar mark. So I guess my biggest question coming out of this is, you know, is this something that is just hard for and, and anybody can answer this? Is this something that's just going to no matter what they do with it? Uh, make it harder on the employers or is it going to be a hindrance to onboarding new employees? I don't think it should be a hindrance to onboarding new employees. I think what it is, is it gives employers a little bit more pause maybe when they're, when they're bringing people up through the ranks and giving them an increase. Um, you look at, at what they're saying in this federal law, anybody that makes this salary or not, mm -hmm. anybody that makes this gets overtime. Um, I've been salaried for a good portion of my career, never got overtime, right? Regardless of, of anything. And so if, you know, the, 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 you know, two or three jobs ago that I had, they would be forced then to give me overtime regardless of whether I was salaried or not. Right. Very good. Let's move on to, uh, another great article that comes to us from residential systems. Uh, Legrand employees save 79,000 in ener in energy marathon 2.0. This was a, a company-wide challenge that ran over the course of 26 days in October to see which location of Lagrange North America could reduce its energy cost. Now, the company as a whole in North America uh, saved or, or reduced its energy use by almost 16% uh, since uh, over those 26 days in October versus the, the same time frame in September. And what was interesting as you as you scroll down and, and read through this article is there are three winning sites, one from each, uh, manufacturing, distribution, and uh, or sorry, manufacturing, warehousing, and their offices. All three of them saved just over forty percent. Rich, is this is this just a a fun you know team building exercise, or does this speak to a, a bigger point with? essentially how lazy or or maybe not lazy but how wasteful uh people are with energy um i i think that's definitely something that we're discovering is that being energy conscious um it's available and there's savings available just today um our city council here in san leandro we just uh approved a tech initiative where um they're going to be deploying citywide um, a bunch of energy saving measures um, and they're bringing a company on 
And I want to say the, the overall amount that they were going to invest in the, in the infrastructure updates was $5.6 million. The interesting part was that the way that the uh, proposal was sent out is that the companies who came in basically had to prove that the system would pay for itself. And the company that was picked, uh, it showed that over a 10-year period that basically all of these infrastructure uh, initiatives are taken are going to wind up paying for themselves. And it was simple stuff like changing out um, lampposts for LED bulbs, um, smart irrigation in parks. Um, so, you know, it, it, there are all of these things that we're finding out is and truly and not going on the IoT bandwagon, but this is that first level um, and that, that we're starting to see that initiative start to come through. I mean, you're seeing more and more solar panels that are becoming available. Um, mm -hmm. We we were out uh, gold panning the other day, and I was really surprised when we were in the gold country in this agricultural area. Everywhere we looked, there were solar panels. And so we're seeing more and more that these initiatives are starting to take hold, and people are starting to understand that, you know, we, we do have to conserve our resources, and there's a way to actively do it without even necessarily uh, – bringing in new equipment just yet but it's just the, able, the ability to gauge what you're doing and, and Legrand and uh, several of the other companies I mean you've got Blue Bolts you've got Middle Atlantic you've got even Snap AV is doing some of the stuff where mm -hmm. they're able to measure the consumption that's coming in and you can actively look and say hey you know where's the power being wasted so I think this is just the beginning I think it's great and uh, you know I hope to see more of it from other manufacturers and from integrators and promoting this because this is a, a real world benefit and part of what we should be doing and presenting as an industry very good. Alex, is this something, because obviously these, these three winner, winning sites had massive reductions. Is this something that is, in your opinion, more uh, achievable because of the competition aspect? Or are some of these numbers reachable in a real world day-to-day -day application? Oh, it's, it's totally reachable. I mean, for every corporation and pretty much every household, the thing that's interesting is it really is about the triple bottom line, right? The idea is you are saving electricity, which is saving the environment, but you're also saving money and you're making the employees or the people who reside in that household or building, making their lives better. And so what, what I find really interesting is the first time I, I visited Apple's headquarters, I remember expecting that they were going to have just crazy technology on their doors and in their bathrooms. And as, as I walked around, and I was just disappointed, I walked around and thought, this place feels dated. And that's been my experience in a lot of these companies. You know, with us, we're a very new company. We don't have, you know, a giant headquarters, and yet we use our technology to run our building. So every night on, on the weekdays, the whole office shuts down by a scene that gets triggered. You know, the air conditioning goes into echo mode. The lights turn off. If music's on, it shuts off. In the morning, certain things automatically open, shades open up, all that kind of stuff. And I think our industry, I mean, if we're not – dog fooding our own products, if we're not using this internally to make, you know, our own environments better, how are we going to do it for customers? So I think what Legrand's doing here is, is great, and I, I hope we see more of this. Very good. Tim, is this something where, you know, kind of what Alex said, where we as integrators might be accountable a little bit for not making use of this technology ourselves, and by extension, not in, in a... a you know, a great place to encourage our clients to do the same. Well, it, it goes back to something that you've tried to teach me for years, and that that's the importance of lighting, right? Uh, yeah, and, and and not, not, not being <laughs> silly here, but but uh, you know, I come from from education and then into the world of programming, and and lighting, except in, in the cases when I had to interface, you know, with an eagle eye or you know, an eagle um, graphic uh, eye. Africa, I thank you. You're welcome. Um, from, I got you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that was the, that was those were my interfaces with with lighting and the importance of making sure that that daylighting happens where you you've got a, a photo uh, cell that you're seeing whether or not you know what the what the brightness in the room actually is from the ambient light and making lighting changes based on that raising and lowering the shades things of this nature. Uh, Alex makes a great point about dog fooding. If you're not doing this, if you don't have, if you have a showroom and you're not showing it, you're missing an opportunity. If you don't have a showroom and you don't, but you don't have it in your house, then maybe, or you don't have a, a place where where somebody can can come and, and experience it, you're missing an opportunity. Or if you don't take them to an experience center or a a, uh, a space somewhere in your you know your your local region, I, I think of New York and I think of L.A. Uh, because a lot of manufacturers, control manufacturers specifically, 
have spaces uh, in New York. And a lot of display manufacturers have spaces in New York where you can take folks and they can experience the technology there. So dog fooding is very important because not only can you tell people what it does, but also how, it, how you live with it. Mm -hmm. What does it look like on a day in and day out basis? You know, Alex mentioned the fact that when they go home at night, a, a timer trigger, I'm, I'm assuming it's some sort of, of time-based, Alex, where at a certain time, systems go off. Well, if you, if you don't have that in your office or you don't have that in your showroom or in your own home, how can you ex explain that to a, a client in a real-world scenario and really you know, talk like you know what you're talking about? Very good. I, I know for ourselves, we've we've had lighting control even in our own home and in our offices for for years, and it's something that you know clients always ask, "What do you do in your house?" and uh, you know how you live in. Every time I run into an integrator that doesn't you know play with this stuff on their own, I remind them that they can't really explain it if they haven't lived it. Well, and, and um, I'll bring up another guy that is on the show a lot, and that's Todd Puma. Mm -hmm. Todd, it, Todd and, and, and Richie is, is another great example of this. Richie has his lab as his house, right? Richie has, has told me for years and years and years, he doesn't put anything in a system that he hasn't put in his own home. Now, Richie has some very interesting things in his house that have not worked out over the last few years, <laughs> but he's got some really great stuff too. But see, it, it, that, that's the nice thing about doing it that way, right? Is you know what works and you know what works in real people's lives because you really lived it. Well, yeah, and that real world experience is, is key. But staying on the, the the lighting topic, let's swing over to hidden wires. Uh, and this comes from Cedia. It's based on a white paper that talks about integrating bio adaptive lighting. Um, this is something that is that's coming kind of down the pipe. It, it's still fairly fresh, fairly new. Uh, but the concept of bio lighting or bio adaptive lighting is that it adapts the the color temperature of lighting to reflect either the mood or the desired uh, feeling that you or the the end user is trying to achieve so when you're looking for you know in the winter up here in canada where we don't get a lot of sun um, we can go with a a much higher wavelength light that more accurately depicts sunlight um, whereas when you're trying to go to sleep you don't want sunlight you want something uh, much much softer. Rich, is this something that is is this something that's on the cutting edge, or is this something that is more? I don't want to say toyish, but uh, is it something that's just a, a passing fad? Uh, you know, I think it's a sell through feature. I think it's 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 like anything else. It's a matter of education, um, and it becomes more a matter of uh, again how simply can you deploy it and integrate it and, and does it create value to some people this not might not make um, you know a difference to them I have certain clients where you know specifically we we shut down the Wi-Fi in the house during certain periods of time because even though it's untested even though we don't necessarily have the studies to show whether Wi-Fi is um, going to affect our health or not it, it still was a concern for a couple of these clients that they'd rather just not deal with RFI at all um, and so you know, is that one out of, you know, five or 600 clients that I've had that request? Yeah, you know, it's pretty rare, but that was something that was important to them. Um, I, I feel the same way about features like this. It's, it's like anything else. Is, is The purpose of, of our industry is um, to be able to facilitate those needs that our clients find important to maintain their lifestyle. It's not up to me to decide what they are. It's up to me to introduce them to it let them decide if there's value, and then go ahead and procure and facilitate for them. And, I, and, and that's the, the goal of what we should be doing as integrators always, is that it's, it's, uh, it's a matter of making the, the, the options available, educating them enough to make a decision, and then giving them a roadmap if they decide to or not. Mm. Alex, this is something that, you know, it's not well, or, or sorry, it's not widely distributed yet. It's not widely available. But obviously, Josh AI tailors to a, a higher end client. Is this something that you guys have come across yet? Oh, absolutely. And you know, we're very focused on learning and how the system can get more intelligent over time. Uh, but I do have to put out the caveat. I actually was involved in helping to write this white paper. I serve on CIA's tech council and, and Peter very well. So I, I got to take an early look and provide some feedback. 
there, there's a lot going on here. It's not one piece of technology. The first piece that I think is really interesting is just the idea of adjusting the dimmer depending on the time of day. So for example, if you go into your living room and it's you know in the morning and you turn the light switch on, you're probably expecting something different than at two in the morning where you don't want to get blinded by a bright light. Or if someone's coming in to clean, you want to turn all the lights on. And so there's the, the idea that the light should adapt depending on the time of day. And that, that's actually a really important thing because it, it really changes how happy the end user is when they turn the lights on, if it matches what they're expecting at, at the right moment. The second piece, though, is there are actually the real health benefits to having the color temperature, the, the, you know, sort of the, the light temperature change depending on, on what's going on. So there have been studies that show if you have the lights change over the course of a meal from your, your starter to your main entree to your dessert, and over time they're getting warmer, you're actually influencing the mood and, and the emotions of the people sitting around that table. And it's, it's interesting because when you're in that room, you don't even notice that you're in more of a blue room or more of a red room, but it does actually impact how calm people can be, how excited people can be. And so there, there are signs that show if you're not getting enough sunlight, you are more likely to get depressed and you can fight that through bioadaptive lighting. So, so there's some really interesting things. The biggest issue though is it's unique to every home, it's unique to every room, and it's unique to every person. And so it takes a, a lot of real machine learning and artificial intelligence to get right. So I think we're gonna see baby steps. We're gonna see this release very slowly over the next three to five years. We're not gonna wake up and it's gonna be a fully featured product tomorrow, um, but I think we're gonna see it for a long time coming. Very good, this is, this is definitely something that I love being a, a lighting guy. Tim, is this something that you're looking forward to in a couple of years, being able to walk into a Lowe's potentially and get an IoT bioadaptive light source? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Um, and, and I'll say yes from the, from the DIY part of my brain who loves to pick up stuff and, and do his stuff in my house and, and you know make my, my wife's life a living hell uh, in all the little gadgets and gizmos that I put on our system. Uh, no, from the fact of, of, you know, working with guys with you, like you guys and Richie and, and Alex, where guys like me will do that, that, and then call you up on Monday morning or Sunday afternoon and go, holy crap, Matt, my, you know, nothing in my house works. You have to fix it because it's Super Bowl Sunday and I have to, it's the end of the world if I can't watch, you know, uh, this, this, this thing. Um, you know, it's, I, I love that idea because, uh, being in the Midwest, we have weird seasons, right? Uh, sometime around usually daylight savings time is when, you know, it will be pitch black by five or five 30. Uh, and, and there are friends of mine who, who have, uh, you know, um, where that, that, that will affect them emotionally. So if you can do stuff like that, like, like Alex was talking about and change their mood by changing the color, I think that'd be a great thing. Very good. Yeah. We get, uh, come come middle of winter, we'll get dark by like four o'clock. Oh yeah, it's, it's fantastic, fun. fantastic. Yeah, and uh, Rich is sitting out in a lawn chair at like nine o'clock at night. So yeah, because it's seventy five degrees. Exactly, he's loving it. Not he's right now, we're we're actually entering into our our season called not not warm. Not warm. So what is it like sixty five seventy? We had rain today. <laughs> we had rain today. We had no, warm although, rain today. I had although I, I will rain. say I will say I was in Yosemite two days ago and. 30 something odd degree weather in shorts and I was happy. So <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. All right. Let's uh, let's finish up with the couple predictions for the holiday season. This comes to us from the one and only Julie Jacobson over at CE pro uh, Argus insights, analyze social chatter and product reviews to determine the season's winners and losers in smart homes. And guess what? Security was a big winner. Uh, specifically video doorbells. They are expecting them to dominate this year with adoption rates potentially around 200 plus percent compared to last year. Um, Rich, it, uh, again, we had this conversation uh, a couple weeks ago go leading up to your Thanksgiving and Black Friday and, and things such as that. Do you see a, a any perceivable increase for integrators with predictions such as this. You know, when you start talking video doorbells, you start thinking Doorbird maybe, uh, Skybell, uh, Ring. 
these are all products that don't always need an integrator. Is this something that you see being effective uh, for integrators when reports like this come out? Absolutely. And there goes Rich. Absolutely, and he dropped. So let's move on. Alex, same question to you. <laughs> I, uh, I think he just came back. We want to give him oh, a take, shot. Take his thunder. Go for it. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of mixed feelings. Right now, we're very much priced towards the high end. We sell exclusively through integrators, and that's the channel that we're fully embracing. And I, I think it's a, a channel that makes sense, and we sort of understand the pipeline. We're sort of watching as these DIY products are coming out and, and you know, actively talking to our customers and trying to figure out, you know, at what level do they want to do things more on their own versus do they want, you know, if, if possible, do they, do they want to even try versus having someone come in? Um, and what we keep seeing is the, the rise of the do it for me type movement where mm -hmm. any consumer could install their own Apple TV. It, you know, is quite frankly pretty simple, yet most of our customers just don't. It might be that they don't have time, they don't want to, they just don't care, but they like the idea that they can bring in an integrator who can do that, as well as touch up everything else in their home. And so at the high end, I don't really see the, the rise of DIY products to be a real concern. I think it, it only offer, or opens up more opportunities and, and more types of products that these homeowners want. What I wonder about and what I think is really interesting is it's creating a new market, a, a new market segment for the smart home. In the past, if you had a one-bedroom apartment, you were not going to put in a Crestron system. And I, I think that's still true today. But could you put in your own Sonos Play One, your own Ring doorbell, your own Nest thermostat? The answer is becoming more, more yes. It's not fully a yes, but it's, it's becoming more true. And so I think the awareness is, is, is great. I think these products are causing the higher-end products to really think about coming down in price and becoming more... Uh, more appealing to a wider array of, of consumers. And so all in all, I think it's definitely a net positive, but we do need to think about the reality of you're not really going to make money selling, you know, $150 DIY product directly. It's part of the whole service package. Very good. Rich, you, uh, you left as soon as you answered the question, but you're back now. I am back. Um, it, do you see these kind of things? You know, the other thing that I pointed out was that Z-Wave has been dominating the wireless um, options and, and the standards for, for smart home. Do you see A, both these products and these reports coming out helpful for integrators? And uh, and B, does do you like to see that Z-Wave kind of seems to be taking over? Um, I, I, I love Z-Wave. I mean, it's, it's, it's no secret that both Tim and I have a great fondness for, for the Z-Wave Alliance and Mr. Klein. And, um, you know, one, one of the things that I got to say is that it, it's absolutely, I mean, just anecdotally speaking, I, I got a couple of calls the past few days about integrating door stations. And so there's, there's the two camps. There's going to be the, the or well, three camps, really. I mean, there's the do-it-yourself, which isn't necessarily going to be from the integrator standpoint. Um, there's the do-it-for-me. Um, and that may be where clients are asking, they have an existing system, um, but maybe they don't want to stand alone that. They're looking a way to integrate it. You know? So some of the, the, the DIY products aren't working, but it opens up the conversation to companies like 2N, um, who's making a great door station that is um, working very hard to integrate a lot more seamlessly with some of the established integration companies out there. Um, and then there is, as Mitch coined very well uh, during an interview at Cedia, the do it with me crowd. And there's that middle ground um, where the client is coming in and it's an opportunity to say, look, yeah, you can maybe do it, but you're, there's going to be some hangups. There's some technical issues with this. There's some things beyond just plug and play as much as the marketing materials try to tell you otherwise. Um, there becomes the, the service and the value added service. And, and you know, that becomes a segment for integrators is that value added service. Um, you know, it, it, along the same lineup, yeah, you can buy a television and yeah, can you can buy a TV mount, but do you really want to do it? Um, so, you know, it, it becomes a matter of where's the value and creating the value for the client and saying, you, you have an opportunity. Do you really want to spend all your time doing this stuff or would you rather be at work doing the things that you get compensated for and allow me to take care of it for you so when you come home, you're good to go? Um, and that's constantly the story uh, that, that has to be really. And, and I think that integrators get a little too caught up in that cycle of uh, all the stuff. 
and it's going to knock out my business. And how am I going to compete with this? And I'm not going to make any money. And, and they start taking an adversarial approach with their clients. Um, and, and there has to be that shift. This is not going to change. There are not going to be less of these products on the market. There's only going to be more of them. Case in point, there's a little cylinder sitting behind me that, uh, you know, <laughs> along with several other little cylinders. Why? Because I have gotten 30 calls in the past month about that little cylinder. Um, and I will say, and I, it was a couple of months ago, I wasn't sure about it. And I said, eh, I don't think so. Had it in the house, and there's a six-year-old who's really enjoying going, hey, house off. And screwing with things, but but you know <laughs> that's the next part that I've got to figure out is how to prevent you know the house from the six year old beta testing. Yeah. Um, but it's from a beta from testing a by a six year old, um, you know. But again, this is you know Josh IA, fantastic product. We we did a great interview with them, um, taking a, a completely different approach. And there he goes. <laughs> it's a good approach. It's a great approach. It's a great approach. All right, um, Tim, I'm going to give you kind of the last word. You know, Richie said he only had 30 minutes, and he's gone. He's I out the door. He's out. Oh, 30 minutes and done. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm telling you, my, even, even, my, even my technology is telling me. Yeah, I must have told, I must have told Alexa to turn off, turn off my internet. <laughs> Tim, you know, the, the last thing that was uh, interesting about this report was that they can tell that home automation hubs aren't getting the visibility and end users are noting that the hubs and the kits and, and all that stuff seems to be challenging for the end users where they can go get, you know, a, a doorbell uh, from Ring or, or somebody like that. They can go get a Nest or an Ecobee or, or whatever other thermostat they want. They can go get a couple lights and they can make those single use products work. Looking at you know kind of the do it for me or do it with me side of things, does that still continue to bode well for people? For integrators? Yeah, absolutely. Because here's the thing, and it goes off of what what Richie said, and he and I will both be the ones to tell you that that Mitch Klein is the one who kind of drilled that into us at, at Cedia this year was the whole do it with me. We have integrators have lost margin year after year after year after year. It it is it is. It, I'm going to say it's over, over, but it's, it, you need to start looking beyond, and I am not the first nor the last person to say that. But here is a perfect opportunity for that. You have somebody coming to you and saying, you know, look, here, um, please, please help me do this. They're not asking you to do it for free, right? You're, you're going to get paid for your service, for your knowledge, for your experience, for the ability to integrate, the, the key word there in the word integrator, integrate all these disparate products under Josh AI, under control for, under however you want to do it. But that is the magic and that is the the art the artistry and the science behind what these wonderful integrators do is they take all these parts and they make them work together. That's what people have done for years. This is no different than that. Whether it's a ring doorbell or it's a nest or whatever or an Alexa, making all these things work together seamlessly is what you guys have done for years. Just keep doing it. Regardless of, of what how much margin you're making on on the boxes, you make your money on the services part part right. You where in your smarts and in your knowledge and the ability to service your customer the best way. Very good. That is gonna do it for today because Richie's got to go. Richie's got to go. Stuff to do. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. I got, I got doorbells to put in today. Doorbells to put in things to. <laughs> that's awesome. Things to integrate. You got stuff. Make you it happen. Stuff. He's got stuff. Um, thank you for, for, for joining us today, uh, gentlemen. Alex, where can people connect with you? Uh, websites, josh.ai. We've got all our information there, uh, but Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, or just email me, alex at josh.ai. Beautiful. Uncle Richie, where can people find you uh, if they somehow are under a rock and have never heard of you under before? Under a rock and they've never heard of Uncle Richie. They've never yeah. talked to you before? Uh, obviously, you can find me at uh, on Twitter at r Fergosa, uh, Fergosa Design. I just want to say one quick thing. Um, oh my gosh. I, you have a time limit, man. I know, man, but uh, but this is important. I wanted to say because I didn't get a chance. I just don't to, want I you got, to blame me. My my internet cut me off. Alexa got jealous. Um, <laughs> I was I was about to say how fantastic Josh AI is in terms of the product that they're putting out, and I I don't want to misspeak, but I want to say that the acronym you're using is NLP, Natural Language Programming. Uh, processing. Natural Natural Language Processing. Um, where if 
if they if you haven't had a chance to check them out, they are taking what we're seeing with some of these Do It For Me products and absolutely taking it to the next level, not only with new systems, but with existing systems. And really glad that you're on because uh, I said I, I, I am absolutely fascinated by the project that you guys are doing. Thank you. Um, other than that, I got to go. Yeah, we go. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Richie. Thank you. Tim, where can people connect with you? Uh, Twitter, probably the best way. Uh, T as in Tim David Albright on Twitter or AV Nation. Beautiful. As for myself, uh, you can find me at Matt D. Scott on Twitter, as well as pretty much every other social platform. Just search that name. You'll probably find me. Uh, more importantly, though, please stop by avnation.tv. You'll find this show as well as a wide variety of other shows that cover all the verticals that we cover. When you visit the site, please take a moment to check out our underwriters. Uh, we are extremely thankful for their generous support, and we'd like you to support them as well. That's all the time we have for this week's episode of Resi Week. <laughs>